this is a spoiler. You can't listen you know. to this and not have spoilers. As our com- whole conversation to summarize this, I, I was thinking about you. I was like, "What? Is she, I don't even <laughs> I don't know how to discuss this book, much less <laughs> summarize it. It's a hundred years. I mean, well, you know, you're gonna do something. You're gonna do big, right? Go ahead, go for it. All right. So this is frightening, <laughs> but I'm gonna give it a shot. This book covers the lives of, I guess, six generations, five, six generations of the Buendia family. 100 Years of Solitude, the book we're reading. And it takes place in the fictional town called Macondo, which is located in South America somewhere. The plot uh, is both can be uh, both simple and complicated. It's simple because it we can just follow the generation, each generation. You know, generation one, it happens. This happens. Generation two, this happens. Generation three, this happens. But it gets very complicated <laughs> because within each generation, enormous, profound things happen. Anyway, a lot of tense th- th- stuff happens within the time frame of a given generation, and it's hard to give a full summary, but hopefully we'll touch on each generation here. Before we get to the simple version, it should be noted that this novel's genre is generally considered to be magical realism, and you see that throughout. And the beginning of the novel is kind of, uh, it's set out that way because Jose Buendia, who is the founder of Macondo, he founded Bacondo after he had uh, had a dream and ha- saw houses all full of mirror, mirrored walls. And mirrors, glass, ice is a very important image that exists throughout this book and reflects the magical realism that really is going on throughout this whole story. So the town of Macondo is founded by Jose Buendia and his wife Ursula, the grand matriarch, for a long time. It's very isolated and on its own. And it's visited by these gypsies, headed by Milkidas, who inspires Jose's fascination with science and the universe. And, and he leaves a mysterious parchment, which comes into play later in the book and is very important. Eventually, Jose, um, unfortunately, goes insane and he's tied up to a chestnut tree behind the house and he dies there years later. All the generations, mostly, is this matriarch Ursula, as we all know. She lives to over 100 years old. She oversees the building of the mansion for the family, the maintenance of it, and running the family, as well as a successful candy business that brings in lots of money. And one of her biggest fears, which is at the beginning of the book and runs throughout the whole book, is obviously there's a lot of incest, or a certain amount of incest. And it begins with her and Jose, because they're first cousins. And it was uh, there's this great fear that existed within her, and the reality of the magical reality of what could happen when they gave birth was uh, the fear that the child would be born with a pig's tail. That was just always a major concern. But that doesn't happen when she gives birth to her children, and it doesn't happen for a very long time until, well, we'll see. Jose and Ursula have three children. This is the second generation. This is Jose Arcadio Amarantha and Colonel Aureliano Buendia. Jose Arcadio is kind of, is the oldest, and he ends up running away with a gypsy girl. Now, I'm going to be brushing past a lot of it because, as you know, as we all know, there are very intense details that happen with every character and with any gen- every generation. And so I'm just going to touch on things and then we're going to have to dig in together because it's just so much. Okay, H- Jose Arcadio, um, he ends up, he's the oldest. He ends up running away with, after chasing a gypsy girl and he returns this huge man with tattoos everywhere and ends up marrying his adopted sister. And he is shot mysteriously. Amaranta is never marries and she dies spinster. And Colonel Aureliana Buendia, as we all know, is major figure for a long, uh, through a long period of the book as he ends up being the leader of these major wars against the conservative government. And then he ends up, uh, I mean, he escapes being executed. And I think it's important that the beginning of the book starts with this image of him standing about to be executed and remembering the ice that his father was showing him. So ice is important. Glass is important. These images. Anyway, we'll get to that. 
Colonel Aureliano, Aureliano Buendia ends up hiding in his room after these wars are over. He escapes execution and hides in his room making fish out of gold. Okay, so both Jose and Aureliano, you're going to get, I'm going to get lost. We're going to get lost, but let's try this. Let's hopefully this will work. Both Jose and Aureliano end up sleeping with the neighborhood psychic. I don't remember if she's a concubine as well, but she's a psychic sort of card reader. Pilar. And ends up create, and they end up creating the next generation with her, Acadio, who is a school teacher, but ends up becoming a dictator figure. I believe he was, can't remember whose parents, whose father of Acadio, but anyway. And then also Aureliano Jose becomes obsessed with his aunt Amaranta, who rebuffs him, and he's killed during the war. Moving on to the next generation, or onward. Okay, at the, around this time, the railroad comes to Macondo, and an American fruit company, which I found out an interesting fact about, but anyway, builds there and ushers in this time of prosperity with the banana company and lots of, you know, working at work and stuff like that. Acadio Maria Santa Sofia de la Piedad. She was pushed onto Acadio by Pilar, her mother. And they create Aurelian, this next generation, Aureliana Segundo, ends up marrying Fernanda del Carpio, who is a very upper crusty, difficult woman. Aureliano ends up taking in Pilar as his concubine who he ends up moving in with and even though he remains married to Fernanda this is a whole drama in and of itself. Ocado, like I say, Ocadio married Santa Sofia and they created not only Aureliano Segundo but also Remedios and she, Remedios is a um, very interesting character definitely coming out of this sort of magical realism. She's this unspeakably beautiful woman who was responsible for the deaths of a number of men who were just overtaken by her beauty for many reasons. She's thought of as possibly having um, uh, mental issues, autism or something, and she ends up dying by ascending into the sky. She was folding a towel and just ascended into the sky. Another example of are we in a real world or not? And then also uh, there is Jose, their brother, Jose Ocadio Segundo, who plays a major role in the strike by the workers at Banana Factory. He's also the only survivor of the Banana Factory genocide, which happens when the company just mows down everyone who is striking. And he's a very uh, pensive, reflective character, and he ends up spending the rest of his time in the library or in the bedroom of the house studying these parchments that were left by the gypsies back in the first generation. Aureliana Segundo, from that previous generation, he married Bernardo. We did that, right? And then they had Jose Arcadio, Renato Remedios, Amaranta Ursula. Okay, so I'm going to go through those people. But those that's what who Aureliano, Aureliano and Fernanda had. Jose Arcadio, he's sent to Rome to become a priest. Although he ends up ditching his studies, we learn later. Returns to Macondo when Fernanda dies. And then he ends up having conflict with some teenage boys in town. They end up killing him. Renato Remedios, the daughter, ends up sleeping with a mechanic who works in town. And when Fernando discovers this, she kills the mechanic. <laughs> even though Renato ends up pregnant, Fernando doesn't realize it. Even though she sends Renato off to a nunnery, she doesn't realize her daughter had become pregnant. And then there's Amaranta Ursula, who ends up having a passionate affair with Aureliano, who was the son of Renato. I guess I'm getting this a little confused, but he was the son of Renato. And that uh, Aureliano was brought back to Fernanda from the nunnery after Renato gave birth to him. And she, he ends up having a passionate affair with Amaranta Ursula. And they end up, at the end of the book, giving birth to the first child with a pig's tail. Are, are you all with me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. As long as I know yeah. we're still alive. Okay. I'm almost done. <laughs> at the end of the, I mean, I know a lot has been sped over, but there's, I can't do everything. <laughs> At the end of the book, Macondo uh, is a very poor, dying town that many residents have abandoned, and we find ourselves left with Aureliano. See, what happened is that Amaranta, who was the daughter of Aureliano and Fernanda, and she ended up having this passionate affair with Aureliano, the son of Renato. So, like I say, or that means that the aunt and the, and the nephew ended up sleeping together and they gave birth to a child with a pig's tail. Now, Amaranta died in childbirth and baby with the pig's tail ended up getting eaten by a bunch of ants or think or something. I can't remember right now. It died. And then, like I say, what we're left with toward the, at the end of the book is Aureliano 
reading the parchments, the parchments who have existed that have existed throughout this book and were studied by a number of different generations and people. And he's studying it and reading it while hurricane rages outside, ripping apart the house, the house that has housed these generations of families over the last 100 years. And this hurricane is ripping it apart, essentially destroying the house, destroying the story, destroying the book, ending the book. And the parchments that end up being decoded by Aureliano reveal everything that we just read in this book, and that the parchments had predicted everything that was going to happen with this family in these generations, in the history that occurred. And at the same time, by reflecting in itself, it's sort of like in a mirror, it did or it didn't happen. So anyway, that's sort of, sort of the end. But I just wanted to quote one thing, a, a quote that I found in The New Republic from 1977. And it says, reality, Garcia Marquez, the author of this incredible book, said in an interview in Barcelona, reality, he said, is not restricted to the price of tomatoes. He asserts that life is filled with the miraculous lying dormant at the heart of the quotidian, adding that for him, the key to writing 100 years of solitude was the idea of saying incredible things with a completely unperturbed face. The ideal novel should perturb not only because of its political and social content, but also because of its power of penetrating reality, and better yet, because of its capacity to turn reality upside down so that we can see the other side of it. Hence, ghosts wander disconsolately throughout the household, the Buendia household. Priests levitate in proof of God, and hauntingly beautiful women like Remedius the Beauty ascends to heaven in body and soul while cleaning sheets out of doors, waving goodbye in the midst of the flapping sheets that rose up with her. Now, that, that was sort of a, just a little small thing, but that was at the heart of what he, what he was doing. Now, also, as we all know, or probably know, this book reflects a lot of Latin America history and, and myth, and it's very fascinating on that level. As an aside, I just want to say that when Garcia, when this book came out in 1967, it had the same effect on Latin America in terms of impact upon the entire population that Beatlemania had on our country. A huge, huge, major effect on that country. And when he died in 2014, there was three days of mourning, the countrywide. So there are a lot of other things. And I know there's a lot of things I passed over, like the, you know, four years of rain and, you know, a lot of the train filled with 3,000 dead people. There's a lot of major things, but I'm passing it to you. Kind of curious if everyone liked the book or had, like, what their first thoughts were. All right. I'm just going to say, I adored it. I think it's phenomenal. Anyway, next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorites, and it was a long time on the read list. So yeah, it's it, it's it's really uh, a classic, you know. And, and I saw it with new eyes, and um, this time around, and so I'm taking things in differently than I did before. You know, like what exactly is the magical? Yeah, magical realism. And hearing that little bit uh, of your quote from the interview, Laura, was helpful to kind of yeah. place what he is going for. Um, right. But anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that short little bit before we start pulling on threads. Yeah, this is my uh, second time reading it. And uh, the first time I didn't really like it, I think I sped through it and didn't quite get it. But uh, things started piecing together for me. So I, uh, I appreciate it a lot more the second time around. Yeah, this was my first reading of it. And at first, it was just very difficult keeping track of all the different strands of the plot and all the different characters with very similar names and so on. But I think that it grew on me as I went through it. I think I came to understand sort of what he was going for a little bit more as it progressed. Yeah, I agree. I felt the same way. Um, my family is, I am not Peruvian. My husband and his family are Peruvian. And, you know, being this girl from the South when I met him and meeting his family, like my husband is first generation American. It was interesting to listen to them talk and they would talk about things and they would sort of every once in a while sort of just put in these things about ghosts or put in these things about some sort of strange thing. And I'm just kind of sitting there thinking, are we all tuned into the same channel? Did you just say that? They have this way of kind of saying really kind of crazy things that are part of their story. And so as I read this book, I thought, oh my gosh, that's totally what this is. You know, <laughs> these sort of, you're reading and at first you don't realize 
that it's magical, unless you've done some research. I didn't really know that it was magical realism. And it's written in such a way that you're like, oh, okay, well, like, clearly that's not what they mean exactly. That's sort of some sort of metaphorical thing, or I'm not understanding some something about it. You know, like, there's a plausible way that you could explain it away. And then as it goes on, you realize, no, this is totally just fictional, you know, fantastical sort of imagery. It's completely made up and it's magical. Um, so there, it took me a while to really realize that, I think, while I was reading the story. And I, I think that's kind of the point is that some of it is passed off. So um, what is his word? Everyday commonplace. Um, yeah, doing quotidian. it with a straight face. Quotidian, yeah, yeah quotidian, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's such a, in such a quotidian way that you're like, wait, is that, wait, what? <laughs> what just happened? And you're kind of left with that feeling. But as far as the entire plot went, it took me a while to like understand, okay, this is a lot of repetition. And I honestly, I didn't understand the solitude until the toward like 300 page 300 i started like oh okay you know uh, three quarters of the way through the book i'm understanding the effect of solitude on you know this family and and what their ultimate end was so i really enjoyed it but i have to say it was it, it was tough to enjoy in the first part of it i didn't really love it in the first part it was just so depressing and sad and yeah like yeah tragic that it was hard to really i would say enjoy i mean i definitely was moved by it but enjoy would not be a word i would use until the end and then i was like okay i, I see the, the names are a disaster I, I feel bad for i think like there's common critiques of people don't like russian books because all the names sound so similar <laughs> yeah. but, uh, jose arcado Wendia, Arliano, like every single one is the same right <laughs> and on that, purpose that, so that's hard only to an american thing that's only an american because all of the names sound very unique to me um, and I had no trouble keeping up with the names, but I think it probably yeah, is a result of the fact that it's, you know, they would probably say that about our, our American names because they all sound very similar, but it, I think they were definitely different enough and, but that they were related. I sort of thought of them in like as jab and cab, and, you know, like by their acronyms, their initials. I feel like the fact that they all have repeating names, not exact repeats, but using Arcadio, uh, Jose Arcadio and, Aureliano over and over again, uh, and also Ursula, etc. It makes me think that the point is something along the lines that the same character traits are repeating in different yeah. generations. And in fact, that something that's observed in the novel, I think on page 181, Ursula observes that while the Aurelianos were withdrawn but with lucid minds, the Jose Arcadios were impulsive and enterprising, but they were marked with the tragic sign. And more generally, throughout the book, there is an idea that the family is marked by a certain fate, a sort of fatedness to suffer from solitude or have a predisposition to solitude or something like that. Over and over in this book, you have an observation about this or that character falling into solitude. And it would be interesting, I haven't seen this, but it would be interesting to see some sort of critical study that literally just takes all the mentions of solitude and try to sort of resolve them all, yeah. figure out what the hell he's getting at. He was, if solitude or solitary or some form of that word was like on every single, maybe not every single page, but it was like every other page. So. It, it's very much a, a theme um, in terms of the generations. And I think the fact that they don't communicate well, they don't share, kind of keep things secret, and they withdraw from each other. And the, the problems that their solitude causes is, you know, for example, when, when the colonel goes out to war and he's this horrible person and he, you know, he comes back and his mother doesn't even recognize him. And then something happened, he goes away again, but then he comes back at some point and they're ready to sort of welcome him with open arms. But he instead chooses to go sort of wall himself off in his shop in that room. And if he hadn't chosen to do that, and if, and if so many of them hadn't chosen to go and sort of wall themselves off, like how different would their generations have looked? Since we're talking about it, I mean, I'll lay out. So my, my takeaway is that like a hundred years of solitude is life and that solitude is kind of a stand-in for the individual experience of a life. And when you have someone, in these cases, they're a, like Rebecca seems utterly alone. You know, she's in the house and the, just like grief, you know, like a real 
what's the great expectations uh, bride figure anyway? You know, just yeah, yeah, like living in you know a lost time and trying not to remember. These people do get very lonely, but it seems like everybody is. I mean, that's just my takeaway of the last line that you know you don't you get you get a hundred years, and what you do with that is what you do with it, and you don't get to reflect on it, and, and you can't predict it, and it's not something to be like ciphered out. I mean, that's not to be, I mean, that in a, in a worse story, that would be a takeaway to like live life. Um, but these guys live really full lives. So that, that doesn't seem to apply. Um, this is just my observation, but I, I don't know what, you know, kind of water it might carry. But Macondo was founded in a very solitary way. It was a town that was built, I guess it was only about 20 people, right? It run, you know, headed by Jose, but it was alone and isolated for a very long time. I think it's built in it in an area that was very far away from the rest of the country. Yeah, I think that's kind of part of what the characters, the Jose Arcadios versus the uh, Arcadianos, um, uh-huh. and throughout each generation. If you're a Jose Arcadio, you're sort of um, one of those people who wants to go out and to like find other things to br- to build bridges to move things forward to kind of there's a push towards progress within each of those characters and the Aurelianos have definitely got a more solitary and more sort of like to keep things the way that they were mentality and so you see the effects of both of those ways of being and their conflict in fact you see it the best I think in the twins and then especially the way they died, I thought that was quite metaphorical and said a lot about the story in terms of there's really, there's a balance, right? Like they both had issues with, with the way that they were. Uh, one being kind of stuck in his, in, I guess he was, he sort of went insane after he, you know, witnessed that terrible tragedy, um, Jose Arcadio Segundo. And then, uh, I don't know, I thought that was, I just thought those were two interesting characters and then the way that they kind of died at the same time and and this sort of different lives that they led, but they all sort of, they both kind of ended a little bit tragically. I guess everybody ended sort of tragically in the story. Yeah, there's that, like, I feel like that's what I felt most when I was starting to get the grasp on the overall story. And there was this widescape view of each life, and it ended up seeming so depressing, as you mentioned it, uh, Jennifer. Like, when you, when you grasp each individual one, even though things were, uh, lives were lived to the fullest, they all ended up so alone. I thought even like Ursula was supposed to be this matron that kept everyone together and was against the grain and tried to be involved in everyone's life. But even she had suffered from basic blindness from very early on and in a sense was in a world of her own making and also ended up, you know, I think a little decrepit and insane. But yeah. Was it very early on though? Because that part, you know, from the beginning, I tried to figure out okay, what year are we in? And and there was a there's like some confusion with time with regard to some things that they said in the beginning of the story versus I think she was like 80 when she went blind. So I don't think she was that. I think she was pretty old. I think that's right. But so, there's a lot of confusion. I mean, there's a lot of jumping backwards and forwards in terms of uh, just flashbacks and flash forwards. Um, yeah. So it's very I mean, it's hard to tell at times. He would, um, he, would, he would tell something that happened at the end, like he would sum up a person's life and you would think you had heard that story. And then the next paragraph, he would begin the story of how it got to that point, which was in the last paragraph. So, you know, you knew at the beginning, you knew the end before you heard the story kind of thing a lot. And that was, I thought that was a little bit confusing at times. Well, I think that was, I think that was intended. From oh, of course, just, it was definitely intended. In terms of the, the fluidity, you know, and the and time history bouncing around playing on itself i mean i think that one of the ways to approach this book and find more enjoyment in it is to read it as so not realistic in any significant way and that as a result even though there is sort of a sort of very basic linearity that goes on as the book goes forward obviously it it jumps all over the place time and that's what they said about the uh, the parchments or, you know, I don't and I don't really have it highlighted or anything. I don't know where he said it, but where they describe them and they talk about how it's told in such a way so that, you know, everything that happens and you know who and how and when. 
but it seems as though it all happened at one instant kind of thing. In one moment. Yeah. Yeah. In one moment. I don't remember that was, but that's, that's how the book read. It was, it was a hundred years. And because you have Ursula who was a really, you know, pillar who is from the beginning, it feels as though it's one lifetime, but it's so many lifetimes. And it was really very interesting to see how they bled into one another and then how everything became insignificant in the end because no one remembered. And it was just like, oh, wow, that's crazy. That's so much what happens in life. Like, what do they say that you're forgotten after what, two and a half generations or two generations or something? Yeah. Nothing will be remembered about you unless you're Einstein or something. <laughs> what does this, I, one thing I wonder about is at the same time that this book is kind of suggesting that these characters are sort of faded, um, it's kind of evoking bits and pieces of Latin American history. And I, I was looking around in the secondary literature to see if anyone had kind of pieced together what the correspondences were. One decent summary that I found was the following. It was from Roberto Gonzalez Echevarria. Uh, I'm probably screwing up the pronunciation, but let me just read the quote. There is lurking in the background of the story the overall pattern of Latin American history, and I'll be just skipping to the relevant parts. Uh, we have a period of discovery and conquest when Jose Arca Arcadio Buendia and the original family settle in Macondo. Then there's uh, the appearance of Apolinar Moscoso, who is a representative from the Republic. The Republic isn't really even named in this book. This is Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I presume it's Colombia because they refer to it as the Caribbean and we're talking about the northern coast of, but even they're just continuing to go, the, the appearance of Opolinar Moscoso and his barefoot soldiers, i.e. from the Republic, is the beginning of the Republican era, which is immediately followed by the outbreak of the civil wars in which Colonel Aureliano Buendia distinguishes himself. Then this period is followed by the era of neo colonial domination by the United States, you know, referring to the banana company coming over and taking over the town, you know, which leads to this strange flood. It's, it's, it's strange. So that banana company leaves town and they say something along the lines of like, well, forget what it was exactly, but it will give some sort of benefits to people or something. But after the rain's clear, and then it proceeds to rain for like four years magically i guess uh, so but in any event going um going back to this summary after the flood there is a time of decay before the apocalyptic wind uh that raises the town at the end and he suggests this critic at chavaria uh the blend of mythic elements in latin american history reveals a desire to found an american myth latin american history is set on the same level as mythic stories therefore it too becomes a sort of myth so what I'm just trying to want, what I'm wondering about here is even though it's really all, it's all, there's all this magic that goes on, how does this all connect to history and what is this trying to say about history and what is Marquez sort of suggesting that people are actually supposed to do or what is he at least pointing out in Latin American history or, or human nature or, or whatever oh. it is? There definitely was like a real banana strike in his life when he was a, a, a young boy. And so that, that affected his family. And it was kind of on a metaphorical level. It had the same. You're talking about Marquez? Yeah. So there was a, there was a banana strike in his, in his town. And the commentary kind of on what, what happens. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a threat of oppression, right? So there's the drive to move forward that, that Arcadio, the, the first generation, Jose Arcadio Buendia wants to bring people in and it ends up being that Ursula starts to bring people in. And then ultimately new people from all over come in. And when the railroad comes in with the coming of the railroad come these people. But even before that, um, there was the outsiders who came in, the mascote, the magistrate. You know, there's that first level of oppression where someone comes into this peaceful town and says, this is how you're going to do it. And they're able to sort of stave that off for a little while, but eventually the outside forces become so strong that they are, you know, this powerful family who founded Macondo is not even, you know, is mythical, is it's not even really something anyone remembers. And then they make up stories about it. The history is rewritten and it never existed. And I think 
it's a sort of way of saying, you know, when you are a culture who has been subjected to sort of a colonialism and a and an outside coming in of other things that decimate your culture and they leave you in a state of oppression and un, and the powerlessness you feel as a culture to overcome that and and what happens when people in great power write history in the way they do so that it suits them and such that everything that was real becomes this sort of mythical, magical silliness. We get that in the story. I, I think that's what it feel. I think that's what it felt like to Mar- Marquez. I think he felt that sense of powerlessness um, as a result of what happened in his country and what what happened to the uh, the culture that he grew up in. So I, I definitely see that that's sort of the big um, connection to him. I feel it's important that like the uh maybe I missed other connections and metaphors, but I don't think the banana company episode, which was a clear, you know, representation of the uh US hegemony, as you mentioned, was suffocating for the rest of the novel in the sense that it was incorporated in this string of living history. It was clearly like traumatic and I think two of the brothers, one went insane and kept thinking about the was two hundred wagon loads of dead people that were yeah. denied existence. And maybe I misread that but I thought like his trauma was like passed on to the other brother uh, after he died as well uh, whereas he repeated that as well on his death yeah because he said remember that right before he died and then yeah i feel it like wove together the story of like a nation the story of a family and in the sense to i i even got with incestuous relationship just the story of civilization itself as it kind of begins it could be read that way as well Right. From the and advent of technologies, the mixing of peoples, the fluidity of sexuality, and the how that becomes more rigid as time passes. I think we should start from the beginning and talk about this because I have to say when I first, the first part in the very beginning, which felt like the very beginning when Colonel Aureliano Buendia marries Remedios and she's like nine, it's very difficult to, it's difficult information to take in being from where we're from. But then I think the point would be that her parents are preparing her for this. So it's a different time and it's a different way of life and it's a different way of thinking. And I, there's just kind of a lot of that in this story and how it's just interesting to be, to read it and feel sort of so disgusted by it. But really the point is not to be disgusted by it. Like these are bad people because they're not the point. And because, you know, the Colonel was one of the more admirable characters at times in this novel. And uh, it's just one of those things. That's just that's the way it was. That's the way that people did things, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe so. So that's so. I, I just want to maybe like set this off in like a direction. We can go back to the beginning and get into some of these details. Maybe with this frame. I mean, we have. I think you were right, Cesar. You can also read this as kind of like a the civilization of people, you know. But it really starts from. And I don't think we've mentioned this. They were in a plantation or like a wealthy town that both of their parents owned. And it was what because they were first cousins. Yeah, that was the yeah. main issue. And then the murder that drove them out of the town also. So what the, the frame I wanted to set up is that they're kind of they're leaving an established society. So it's not quite Adam and Eve. And they have at least the foundations of Christianity. Right. And they're going off and they're at the same time trying to trying to go off and maybe find some kind of like primitivist society where they can, you know, be at home. And that's kind of Arcadios, but then he switches. So, so that's kind of Arcadios. He's going out, but then you see the baggage of society being brought in by Ursula who like, doesn't want to inbreed to pigtails, you know, like that's one of her, right. that's one of her fears. And that's like a taboo and that's a cultural thing. Right. And yet they, uh, once they get there, you see Ursula becoming like the definer of the home and let's say little city conservative. And you see uh, Jose Arcadio Buendia go nuts on technology and wanting to expand his lot in life and not and be more than an animal. And I think that that tension right there is what's played out because even the gypsies very early on th- are threatening to Ursula's conservative sense, but are enlivening to Jose Arcadio's, let's say, liberal sense of like, you know, like exploration of ideas and thoughts and the way things can be and And the universe yeah yeah. and you know and and isn't getting it wrong either right like i mean he does seem like cool at some points but then figures out the earth is round on his own you know after giving some formulations um, right and like gets the gold back 
anyway, all of these are just details, but I, it, it seems to me there's a conflict of time, which is broad, but I mean that they're, they're at once trying to defy, uh, they're not trying to like live in time. They go out of it. And then it's like, uh, someone was saying like it, it encroaching on them. It just keeps coming in waves and wears it down. Um, I, I think that's so, so interesting when you think about that concept and the, ma the mansion, if you just look at the mansion over time and you think about how many times it was, you know, it was first it was built and then it was added onto and then it was in disrepair and then it was made new again and then it was in disrepair and then it was made new again. And it was just like this cycle of, you just had this image, of this house that had been patched together and worn and reworn over the years kind of reminds me of that time marching on and, and yeah, something it, mm. needed knocked down well I, I just wanted to add that like there's so there's a way that she thinks about time that i think um not the malchades thinks about time and that's what the the parchment was at the end that it's not going forward it's going in a circle and rather than it's reflecting on itself well i uh, but ursula specifically says wait, wait wait i'm li i'm missing you all say it again uh, i was just saying ursula specifically says she believes it's going in a circle now, Chiedis might put it that it's all compressed at all one time so that you're seeing the birth and death of someone in the same day if they were born right. and raised in the same room. And I, I just, you know, this was old lit class, but uh, we read a novel and an idea came up in it that was um, how the Native Americans thought about. And I hate, I, I don't, first peoples is better, I think. Anyway, my phrasing here. Uh -huh. That they have a way of thinking generationally, six generations forward and six generations back in this fictional instance, you know, of this tribe. And I thought that that generational, before you make every decision, you would think six generations forwards and backwards. And that was a new way of dealing with time. And it had a way of encountering your generational history. And I, I just feel like that, that just might be a lens to see how little I know about being able to approach this, you know, from a from like their mythology and like cultural history. It's a bit like Murakami. Like, I'm not sure what real life Colonel Sanders means, but you know, I take it as, you know, significant. So I'm not sure what he's doing with all of these things, but I just wanted to kind of put out maybe a bag of tricks. You mean in terms of time? Uh, in terms of how to think about time and how he might be thinking about time and how maybe there's cultural differences of thinking about time. Um, I'm gonna there are cultural differences. I'm quotes. sorry, go ahead. Yes. I'm going to read yes. one quote that you, you, have, you brought up. It's on page 335 of my version. It says, what did you expect, he murmured. Time passes. That's how it goes, Ursula said, but not so much. When she said it, she realized that she was giving the same reply that Colonel Aureliano Buendia had given in his death cell. And once again, she shuddered with the evidence that time was not passing, as she had just admitted, but that it was turning in a circle. Is that the part where you were yeah, exactly, referring? Yeah, exactly. And, and I just pull on that thread and then Malchiati's thread with his parchments and then extra, you know, um, text was thinking about how different cultures reflect on time and how that might be relevant to how we think about what's going on here, because we you know, tend to progress through the story from the beginning in its genealogical order, even though it does jump around a little bit, you know, narratively, um, we get chronological state, you know, we're not jumping ahead to years and coming back. But, you know, then at the end, you know, we kind of get the impression that that might have not been the way to be perceiving these things and that there were hints all along that things were timeless. So anyway, I, I just want to maybe underline that. Well, I mean, I think that's why they have those images of that. You have the images of the ice and the is image of the glass uh, mirrors. That's sort of a, a way of moving your subconscious to not think about time in a linear way because we naturally are going to read when you read something you read it in a linear way and actually the way the plot is laid out or plots there is sort of an undercurrent of linearity because that's what happens when you have generation after generation of generation it follows a linear line but it isn't and i think that's why he also i mean he introduces a lot of elements to sort of mess with our perception and sense of time here but some of them have to do i think with those images of ice and glass and mirrors and circles it's kind of it was like at the end i was like okay so basically this is a case for just not figuring out 
either figuring out all your stuff or not figuring out all your stuff. Because it was kind of like all of these patterns are repeated generation after generation. And part of the reason they're repeated, which is I think such as in real life, is because no one really ever heals. No one ever really comes to terms with the issues that they face. They kind of go off in their solitude and they don't work them out in relationship, right? They don't. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what he was saying. So then they, so that, then at the end, you have this situation where it's like there's this parchment that tells everything. So you kind of, I thought about it like, okay, if I go to a therapy session and I found out all the whys and the wherefores about why I make the choices that I make and the decisions that I make, it's not going to make a damn bit of difference. You know, the difference it would be in the doing of something different. And so, and there's at one point, there's a quote in the book where he says something like, you know, all of that basically doesn't matter how much you knowledge you have. If it doesn't help you invent a better recipe for chickpeas, what good is it? So the point is they spent all their time trying to decipher this stuff and trying to figure it out, but they never really like lived. They never went out into life and had relationships with people. They lived in their solitude. So I don't think that they did live that well. I think if you don't go out and have relationships with people and work through the issues that you have, or if you don't try to kind of become open about things, because so much could have been avoided if the last dude had known who he was. Like so many of them didn't know who they really were and things happened as a result of them not knowing their true identities. In a way, it's understanding that you de do need to know who you are. You do need to understand your demons. You do need to like analyze yourself a little bit. But at the same time, you have to go out and you have to be in relationship with people. And that's how you work through your your struggles, but not by, you can't, no man is an island, right? You can't do it alone. You can't just sit in a room and figure out life. It's got to be figured out in relationship to other people. And they really met their sticky end a lot of times because they just didn't do that. They didn't commune with one another in, in, in a meaningful way. I, I was just going to say a counterpoint to this might be the second generation of Buendia's because Colonel Aureliano Buendia, though he sequesters himself later on, I mean, it's hard to find when, okay, so anyway, two examples. Let's look at his life. He was the introverted guy who wasn't going out, and then he turned that around and became a general and fathered 17 kids at least, and uh, da, 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 da. And so by that measure, he was out there and has lived more than most uh, modern Americans, you know what I mean, in that way. But then you have someone like uh, Jose Arcadio, who was presumably just really fucking happy and got shot in the ear and died without any kind of solitudinous remorse. And that just seems like a, but I think that the stories are a little bit interesting. So I don't think that like straight up solitude with a kind, I mean, I, I take what you're saying is like a good point, but, and I'm not trying, and I don't have a specific reading, but I think that taking solitude, uh, like a hundred years of solitude as to be a definition of the individual life makes more sense for Jose Arcadio, because it's not like it was a nameless tragedy. I mean, my reading of it this time was that all that land he was stealing from people, they finally just assassinated. Yeah. And he was stealing money and stuff like that and didn't give a fuck because he didn't have to because he was the big guy on campus. But then he got shot in the head. And, right. you know, that's and, and so those are just differences with the, the notion of solitude as a uh, affliction versus as a condition. Well, they, I've also seen in secondary literature here and there that they describe this family as very egotistical, like the solitude that exists is a form of egotism. Well, I don't know how it would not be. I mean, I guess if you were some kind of like aesthetic hermit, that that may, might fit that definition. Aren't we all allowed to be alone if we want? Yeah, I just don't. I feel like <laughs> it's it's kind of like a. Um, I'm just not taking that charge exactly right because I don't no, know. No. I don't. Know, I don't know what a counter example of that would be. Like, I'm not sure what it's saying other than to maybe add ego where it doesn't really. I mean, Jose, uh, uh, Colonel Aureliano thought that his pride was getting in his way. So that point might land well there. He thought that right. if he could just get that beside him. He could be more victorious in battles and realize that he was waiting on people to change their minds. And that was a mistake. Well, I think what's interesting I, about that character is just, I don't know. I mean, maybe if we could just discuss that for a little bit. You know, Colonel Aureliano, let's call him Aureliano because that's what he first was. And Calling him two different names is apt because when you learn about his character later, I just found it to be like staggering who he became, right? You never saw that coming. Kind of like, by the way, you never saw that coming when um, Amaranta says, 
no, I don't want to marry you. And then the dude kills himself. Like that was one of those wild moments in the book, but we should get to that one as well. But he was this gentle soul, right? He was in contrast to his gigantic brother and he was kind of softer and more feminine and like definitely he wasn't, he was not as masculine as, as his brother. And then like he didn't sleep with anyone for a very long time. And so he goes and he sleeps with Pilar, right? right. Yeah. And she divergenizes a lot of Wendy, as it seems. And then mm-hmm. it, still you see him as like a meat character and he marries this girl. It's so young, you know? And if we get over the fact that it's really pedophilia and we just sort of say, okay, she was a young girl, which I think we're supposed to. I mean, am I supposed to be as offended by that as, as I was? But I don't think I was. I don't think I, I- I think that your response is actually kind of valid here. I mean, I I think Aureliano has this problem of his way of going out into the world and trying to work with and commune and love other people kind of just has this way of reinforcing his own solitude. Um, I was really struck by this when during the Civil War, when Aureliano was a colonel and he was leading the liberal rebellion against the conservatives, he eventually renounced really all of his liberal ideals just for the sake of trying to make the liberal party appeal more to the populace and thereby improve the base of support among the people um and around that time oh, hold, i just sorry i just want to put a fine point on that was that he realized that what they were asked by all those acquisitions was that they were just talking about pure power and that yeah. was, i think the i think so i think that's just a stronger form of his decision making he did he kind of lost all faith at that point yeah well it, i mean marquez the way that it's put in the story is that he was lost in the solitude of his immense power and when he's talking with officials from the party as to what they're actually going to be fighting for what he's what aureliano says is that means that all we're fighting for is power and and he ends up agreeing to this document with the officials from the liberal party that yeah that's what we're going to give up our ideals and just make it so that we're fighting for power and that, and there's a yeah. good quote that kind of goes back to the beginning with him with regard to that, where we kind of, from the beginning, he was never for anything. He said, if I have to be for, I don't know where it is, oh, because I have an actual book here. It says that, you know, I ha- I'm going to butcher it, but he says, if I have to be for anything, I'm going to be for the liberals because those conservatives are tricky because he sees his father-in-law, um, Magistrate Mascote, messing with the, the vote, the liberal versus conservative votes. And he He's kind of, I think, like, this is despicable, so I'm just going to join the other side. And it's just by chance that he joins this. I mean, I think he does have some liberal tendencies because he says, oh, I feel sorry for, he says one or two things that maybe make you think he's really liberal. But but at the end of it, you kind of realize that he, he seems to be fighting for something that is opposed to the despicable actions of his, you know, of what he sees the tricky people of the conservatives. You know what I mean? Yeah. What sets him off is, uh, isn't that a, a woman that's beaten to death or, or beaten up? Yeah, it's the soldiers of uh, Muscote, isn't it? Like, he's just against no. the fact they're horrible, right? They beat this woman and he's not against, he's not for anything. He's just against that. And then he actually ends up becoming that in some weird way. But yeah. What's the connection between, you know, Jennifer mentioned earlier on, you know, this problem in Latin American history of powerlessness in the face of outside forces and what is the connection between that and solitude and i i feel like there's a sense in this book in which the solitude is maybe a way to solve or somehow remedy the powerlessness they feel in the face of not only political forces but also natural forces just their own isolation there's a quote later on in the book. When Amaranta is the child of uh, Jose Arcadio Buendia and Ursula, uh, the first generation, she's she's weaving a shroud and her own death shroud, really. And she has an observation. She So there's a lot of characters in this book that enter into some sort of weird, repetitious activity. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. The doing to be undoing thing. Yeah, and this this is the quote. It was then that she so she's doing this weaving 
of her own death shroud. And it, it's the quote is, it was then that she, i.e. Amaranta, understood the vicious circle of Colonel Aurelio Buendia's little gold fishes, the little gold fishes being Aureliano's own version of this repetitious activity. He makes a bunch of little tiny gold fishes. Over right, over right, right. Um, right. So continuing with the quote, and this is the crucial part, the world was reduced to the surface of her skin and her inner self was safe from all bitterness. Yeah, that deserves a pause. So it's kind of like saying that the things that they do are a protection, like mindless kind of busy work, maybe to prevent themselves from going too inward. You well, know, that happened over their life. I think the idea is that they use it to in order to turn inward, that, you know, reality is such that the best thing that you can do is sort of turn inward in this way. Um, in this sense, I think they're not, it's not just some sort of weird genetic predisposition towards uh, solitude. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I think it's their external circumstances that are pushing them in that direction as well. Yeah, I was just going to actually, yes, I want to second that and say that I think that another point was, you know, this isn't like allegory exactly, but I think that if we read this as like mythology, then we can get a lot more out of these characters what happened to them in you know the storied way that they go down because it's less like they have a conventional set of circumstances and then we're seeing these characters you know bump up against that it's really that they're very interesting characters and in very unconventional you know conventional circumstances which you know really like amaranta is very tragic because just let like let me just run through her love thing right here i mean she gets attracted to pietro as well and her sister does too and they fall in love and feels rebuke. And whenever Rebecca rebukes Pietro and uh, he decides that he can go and get her now, she feels that and wants to make him yearn for her like she felt he didn't yearn for her with Rebecca. And so it's very psychologically understandable. And then he kills himself, again, psychologically understandable. Like all of these characters, I feel like have a very logical, consequential interaction with one another. You know, so Jose Arcadio rips people off and is living high on the hog and gets killed because of it. You know, it, it, when Pietro kills himself, it's because he thinks that she'll never love. And she was like, oh, I was just messing with you. You know what I mean? Like, I just needed you to, like, really prove it or whatever. That just sent chills on my spine when I read that. Such a calm demeanor. Oh, I would never marry you. And thought that she was just gassing him. You know what I mean? Like, you could tell that she just wanted him to keep crooning. And but then that same thing like turned her bitter and she couldn't accept anybody again and even rebuke people who would have taken her like time and time again. And it was just this hardening. And like Rebecca chooses to be with Jose Arcadio in this like passionate affair that's just wonderful. And she doesn't even need her family. But then he gets shot in the head and then she's left for, you know, 70 years. So in that house, in that house that grows around her. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's like biblical. It is actually very biblical. And I think that there's a, re I think that that's definitely a good word for it because there's a lot of pestilence and there are these sort of signs with the yellow butterflies and the yellow comes up here and there and this sort of tragic feeling to the whole book. Um, I agree with the, the kind of stand-ins and the consequentialism you described, Nathan, but in the same sense, I feel like these aren't rational characters that you would take from other books. I mean that in the sense of, well, maybe I've just been reading too much economics, but like <laughs> rationality is having certain goals and then acting in order to achieve them. You wouldn't think that Rebecca acted wisely by sitting in a, in a room for 50 years or that, um, you know, after going crazy, the, the patriarch would just was chained to a chestnut tree, and that was fine. Yeah. <laughs> or reading the manuscripts for years on end, or even uh, well, Orleano Buendia, the after he came back from the war, he also just fell into solitude. It doesn't strike one as like, yeah, but that's attack. a rational argument, though. Yeah, and like, you can't apply rest. love and you know, like yeah, you, you can't apply that to this. losing life. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, what do you? I mean, what do you know if you've seen like? I'm not saying you, but like. You know, I've seen someone's head blown off in front of you that you love and, you know, expected to make love to them in like 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Like, that, like that's hard to square. Jose Arcadio Buendia, he does not do rational things. I mean, he is definitely, he's the beginning of sort of like 
crazy behavior. You know, he's really out there with the stuff that he does. What, like, what, uh, like what? Like, I just felt like when I was reading his first character, I'm like, I, I know, I know this guy. He's the guy who always has a harebrained scheme, who never really gets anywhere. He's so smart. He's got a lot of really good information. He, I'm sure he's filled with promise and possibility. <laughs> you know who we're talking about? Me. Okay. The very first, the patriarch, Jose Arcadio Buendia. Oh, okay, okay. You know, and Ursula constantly, and the women in this in these stories are the rational ones, are the sort of more down to earth, like, I'm going to smack you around and, you know, get you in line. Because the women have definite issues. I'm not saying that they don't. Yeah, yeah there's but some women, I'm telling you. No, but I'm telling you, these 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 men do some really nutso things that would never, you know, they're, they're not what everyday people do. This isn't an everyday right. situation. Yeah, so it's not an everyday like, world. Like, adventure off so that he can be with someone whose society would reject is a very rational proposition, right? Like, he wants to be with someone he can't be with. And so the only way to do that is to use his party and hailness to go off and make another society. Um, well, with- I'm talking about more about the times he goes and, you know, spends weeks on end giving up his life trying to figure out how to turn gold, you know, things into gold. I'm talking about those kinds of brain schemes that he has. He has these bouts of lucidity and sort of really great ideas where he sets up the town and he becomes this great hero. But then there are these times where he does things that are just ridiculous. And you're like, how is he not a laughing stock that he's doing these things? Yeah, I just, I, you know, but those things seem connected. So I don't know that you get rid of his, you know, uh, discovery of uh, a global earth. And also, you know, I, 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 don't, I just don't know that those th- two things can come, you know, like undone from each other. And it seems like, you know, one would lead you into other things where you might, you know, invest everything and, you know, go mad for a time. And that seems like those two things would ride along with each other. The fact that we're having this conversation, I think, is part of the tension, right, in the story, because you kind of get these hints while he's doing these things. Like, there's part of you, there's probably part of everybody that reads it that's like, oh, my God, why is he doing this? This is nuts. But then you think all he needs is to actually accomplish one thing from his crazy harebrained scheme, that will, and all, all of this silliness will have been justified by some discovery or something. And that's kind of how things get discovered. Like, there's a... There's a way that they talk about the vapors in the lab such that you, when they introduce the daguerreotypes, is that how you say that? Yes, yes, yes. You guys yes. noticed the way that they kind of introduced that. It was the same kinds of things that he had already had in his lab. And it just gave me the feeling that like, this is the guy who experiments and does all these crazy things. And then something really, ama- if, if nothing amazing is invented, then he looks like a nut. But if something amazing is invented, then suddenly he looks like a hero. And that's the only difference between people that are like him is that all you need is one sort of invention to be, you know, justified in your crazy harebrained schemes. Didn't he invent a solar weapon that he tried to sell? I, uh, I didn't mean the rational thing as a pejorative way. I meant it as I think <laughs> it's a poor, I meant it as a poor framework with which to analyze these characters. Like even just think about like the last book we read and we could think about the framework of this prototype having plans and succeeding eventually in living out his kind of evil life or, but I feel <laughs> the totality of these characters are super messy and complex and they don't break down to just even, you know, the patriarch was a mad dabbler. Like at one point he dabbled in alchemy, at one point he gave it up, at one point he took up the benches. And yeah. a few of his life he's sitting by a chestnut tree, <laughs> a chestnut tree. And it, it all this, uh, it fills into this messy life that has a more realistic tinge to it, despite the, the magical aspect. It's like a telenovela. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, um, but I kind of wonder if, the characters do have a certain sort of rationality if you take the goal that they're interested in as being sort of individualization, I guess you could say. I mean, a lot of the stuff that seems crazy, I don't know, it's like they're trying to assert themselves in the world and to try to, you know, differentiate themselves from society and nature and kind of make their mark on the world. And then that eventually fails, which drives them into other sorts of avenues for trying to assert their own selfhood. And it's neurotic in the end, but 
you know, it's at least it sort of makes sense what they're trying to do through their actions. I'm I'm wondering if the, you mentioned the selfhood of a personality and these current types, which are shown through names and through clear like personality traits that these characters have. I wonder how much his opinion on actual freedom and freedom of choice is, because there seems to be the strong tinge of determinism and. I mean, it, this is what depressed me and made me sad because it seems that people are chained to their fates in such a way that there is no hap. There's well, not very many happy ever after stories in the sense that it's you know a good book and not cheesy. But I think it's a fatalistic book. The one other thing I were to mention is the saddest line to me was when Ursula at one point I, I can't find it was uh, realizing that uh, the Colonel Orleano had was incapable of love. You know, despite oh, having yeah. these seventeen children, despite going after the nine-year-old that's what she realized in the end but it was all a uh play of stubbornness or something like that where i thought that amaranta was too capable of which is why she couldn't give herself to any one person i had a hard time with that section because i was thinking is that sort of a truth that we're supposed to take or is that more commentary on ursula and the way that she sees her kids because i just felt like i couldn't believe that the colonel aureliano whatever you know that guy he just the way she described him made him so unlikable to me and so sort of sad and terrible that and one dimensional that i just was like well that's more a commentary on ursula and her point of view and what she maybe needed to herself he did that, best friend to being shot <laughs> but he didn't go through with it Oh, I, for, I forgot about that. Yeah, he goes, you know, and uh, uh, but then the guy is like, you know, honestly, if this is what you're trying to do, then like just shoot me and they like make up or whatever. But he lays him out even more. Uh, but that, sorry, that's an interesting moment. Maybe we can put a pin in that. But he basically lays out Aureliano saying that, you know, he doesn't realize that he's gone too far and that he's you know, become a monster. He's become what he's fighting against. And I think when he comes back, there's that sort of metaphorical circle that he says nobody can come within 10 feet of me not even you know my mother and i think when you look at that and you say okay what does that mean what like on just a metaphorical level he's he's walled off his heart right he's gone out in my opinion this guy started out with such a noble and just reason for fighting the war and i thought if i just take that character in isolation and what happened to him he was a tender-hearted guy he was disgusted by something that happened and disgusted by a lack of justice and he goes out and he uses war and he fights for justice but the point being that when you engage in war you become what you detest right war is not the answer like war is just going to make you worse and so he in his way he he had to put that circle around him and not kind of feel because that's what you have to do when you engage in war so i guess it just felt like yeah this guy is definitely got issues but i don't think that he is so that's not that's just such a simple way of describing him that i felt like no he's way more complex than that because after he comes back he does change and his actually his mother's point of view about him changes even so he becomes aware of what he's become. And I think that the way that he's changed as a result of the war and then and what he became weighs on him. Once he becomes aware of that, I think that's why he has to go into solitude. And I think it's a protective mechanism that every character uses as a, as a way of coping, you know, with this really horrible things that happen in life. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of causal thing that I'm talking about. You, you know, I think that that's, I think that that's right. It makes sense. It adds up. You know, it's actually a tragic story. The more tenderhearted and the more hollowed out he is, you know, like it's sadder, but it's just, it epitomizes it. And so I, I'm kind of caught up. I'd like to be able to, can we go back to the, uh, the idea of irrational, uh, thing or maybe like what their other motives might be or like what makes, what doesn't make sense, I guess, because like I, I see this kind of like, you know, ping pong things that they set themselves in motion. And that's what makes it kind of tragic is because it's tied to them and how they are. Remedios doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I just think in isolation, I don't get the point of her character in the story. I mean, I know I, I kind of get it, but I'm not 100% sure that I'm really getting it. It turned Aureliano, I think. No, no, not her. Remedios the beauty. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. That's our happy ending right there. She got out. <laughs> that's, that's actually... Blew out. Is that what it is? Is that she kind of is the only right? She's a genius. That's what was interesting. Mm -hmm. Seeing Colonel Kurt's eyes through war and then saw her and you know knew that she was beyond him. 
and uh, you know could see the fabric or whatever. Can I actually link that up with something? Because at the end, you know, uh, Aureliano, the son of Mae and the Ghibli, mechanic. Ghibli, mechanic, yeah. So that Aureliano has a friend in town who is a bookstore owner who is this old Catalan. Um, right. And eventually the Catalan leaves and the Catalan writes back to Aureliano with advice. And the advice is as follows he ended he i.e the cat the old catalan bookstore owner he ended up recommending to all of them that they leave macondo that they forget everything he he i.e the catalan had taught them about the world and the human heart that they shit on horace uh you know one of the writers that the catalan had them read and that went yeah. wherever they might be they always remember that the past was a lie, that memory has no return, that every spring gone by could never be recovered, and that the wildest and most tenacious love was an ephemeral truth, ephemeral truth in the end. What's the solution to this tragic fate then? <laughs> That's like, and what characters honestly get closer to getting out of it right like i think the book is it's obviously a bad whatever is going on with these characters it's a bad pattern or process it leads to tragedy there has to be some way out of here right also it's a bad world like it's not individual characters like you know creating their circumstances i mean you know banana companies and you know, like other you know like the gypsies even you know and then the Muscote coming in, you know, all the things that we've detailed. I mean, it's this kind of constant attack. And so, you know, I'm not, I mean, is it just tragic? Is it cautionary? I think it's interesting that Aureliano, the last one, the one that didn't die, the last name was Babylonia. And the story of Babylonia in the Bible is such that, I'm sure you all know, but I'll just say it, is such that the people of Babylonia, right, they felt like they could, depends on your interpretation, right? But the people of Babylonia thought they could, they could, build the tower and they could sort of be like the gods and the punishment was that they all had different languages and the punishment like i've read different versions so i'm like there's the mythological version that i read in greek mythology that version and then there's the bible version so the idea is that if they think that they can work together because they can all communicate and they can build the tower to the sky that god kind of puts them against each other by having them all speak different languages and they can no longer communicate. And so I thought that was an interesting name and I don't think it was on accident. I mean, maybe it's a common name in Latin America. I'm not sure. I think the um, names are significant. Right. Didn't that seem like really significant? And the point being that, you know, when people don't communicate, when people don't talk to one another and, you know, confusion happens, it leads to, well, it leads to confusion and it leads to problems. And they should have been more communicative about what was going on and more open and less solitary and less in solitude. And some of these tragedies would have happened. I don't know. I don't, nobody seems to. Well, I mean, it, what could they, so, I mean, it's easier to see, like the only thing I can think of is like how to rewrite the story so that things are happier, you know, like if, why? let's say, oh, why? Why? What, what do you, uh, this is just a thought. Why? I'm not trying to. Oh, okay. I, okay. No, okay. I, I'm, like that's the only counterfact that could make them doing things differently make sense. Like I, I don't see that they could have done. And so this is like again, like just a tragedy or a cautionary tale. I mean, if if they if Amaranta, you know, had run to Pietro and said, "Fine, I'll be second, you know, that was the thing that I was like, "What the hell are they putting this off for? Why do they have to wait a thousand years?" And then it was like another like. A new church or something. Yeah, and that was a part of the new development is that they had to bring their god along with their magistrate. But yeah, I, I agree with your take, Nathan. I feel like a big part of this is, you know, they're not living isolated and the outside world is acting on them. And you see this life as it is lived and not through this narrow frame of a character having a plan and developing it. Like even the the example of, um, uh, what's the Italian's name? Crespi? Is that right? Yeah. Pietro. Yeah, yeah. So, like, because Amaranta threatens to kill her sister, her half sister Rebecca, if if she married Crespi. Right? There were so many great lines like that. 
you know, it, it, no matter how far they send me away from you, I'll make sure that I'll you kill you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. And then Rebecca, you know, out of nowhere, because uh, Jose Ocadio came back, ends up with him. Like it just all of a sudden, but it, but it made sense. Yeah, that flat out attraction. And then she completely, you know, rejected Pietro. And, you know, maybe she, yeah. It, and even, you know, and there's also, I think it's worth, I mean, now that we're in the late hour, it's worth mentioning that this, that Marquez, um, you know, obviously has a very rich imagination, but the story kind of goes beyond its borders with other short stories, specifically um, Innocent Era Diera and the Melancholy Whore. It's a girl who is brought in very early on that Jose Arcadio leaves to pursue. Remember her tragic story where it was that she accidentally burned down the house as a child and her evil stepmother forced her into prostitution to pay for it back and the life they were leading. And so she was in constant, you know, um, servitude. And but that story is continued and I, I can't oh, yeah. recap it um, in a short story. And so that might be true moreover in other places. Are you saying that story about the girl that he found he for 20 seconds? Can you finish that story? That's an entire short story. Wow. That's a terrible story. Oh. Well, I think that she gets, I mean, tragic and sad and terrible, but there's more to it. They bring up the the man. Anyway, I just wanted to, to just underline that Marquez has um, maybe got more of a universe than just in the story. And so, you know, it's worth yeah. further reading to go into other things, like a very old man with enormous wings is paralleled in that thing that they find and hang up. You know, that devil that was walking around the streets and hooves and stuff like that. This isn't a, a, a singular entity, this story, is what I'd like to just maybe suggest. And I think along those same lines, to try to sum up like the purpose or the meaning or the whatever of the story, I think it would be kind of silly because it is full of so much meaning and it's it's life itself you know and it's everything that we experience and everything that we know to be true in this sort of concentrated form of this generations of people in this one family so of course it's exaggerated because it's all of everything that can be experienced in life is happened upon this family and it's everything that it's experienced since the dawn of civilization you know happened over the course of this hundred years. And it's just a representative of that. So you're going to have, I feel like it's just, it's so hard to talk about because you're going to have every single theme that could ever be in a book is in this book. It feels huge. Yeah. And so, you yeah. know, when you talk about the telescope and the magnifying glass and he says, pretty soon you'll be able to see in everyone's home and, or something like that in the very beginning. And it's a commentary on change and progress and the effects of outside forces and what happens when a family is affected and you know you start with your little nuclear family and then you you know people go out into the world and then the family dynamic changes and it's a commentary on that if you if you live in a or in a family right now or if you've had a family of your own where you've got this little small nuclear family and it's such a culture and then somebody gets married and everything changes and kind of you could write an entire you know dissertation on just that and it's all of that is in here it's almost Can impossible I, to talk about i i think that the character that I think comes closest to having a halfway decent strategy for dealing with, you know, solitude and this situation that they're all in, I feel like is me, um, the child of Fernanda and Aureliano Segundo. Is that yeah, the one on. whose lover gets shot in the back? I'm just trying to. Yeah, that's right. Ends up a mute and a nun in a convent for the rest of life. And a nun, not everyone. Well. It was great until that whole thing happened. <laughs> uh, so just to explain her background, just to remind everyone of her background, basically she was raised by Fernanda, who is a very sort of strict aristocratic woman. She has all these aristocratic pretensions. Um, and Fernanda, you know, sent her off to learn the clavichord. Uh, to, she became a clavichord which is like a piano i guess like became a clavichord virtuoso and there's a comment on 270 saying mimi bore up under the exhibitions with the same stoicism that she had dedicated to her apprenticeship it was the price of her freedom she seems more of an in truly sort of independent character until literally she's physically forced to the convent i mean i I don't know. I mean, there's almost like a sense of she understands the advice that the old Catalonian was giving to just you just need to like leave like you need to. I don't know. I mean, 
Yeah, I get it. Yeah, you got to get out of here. You got to do something different. Like even if you're physically there, like you have to kind of just pretend and almost be, uh, you know, in terms of dealing with the shit that people throw at you, like you have to kind of separate yourself from it in some way. Although now that when I'm describing it, even though I like I found her to be the most rational, I guess you could say character in a way, uh, or at least the one with the best idea of kind of what to do. I mean, obviously, her approach doesn't work either. I mean, it's the beauty. Yeah. Can I just write, uh, read out one quote? There's from a writer named Octavio Paz. A apparently, he wrote a book in 1950 called The Labyrinth of Solitude, which, it, you know, suggests there was some sort of pre existing kind of philosophical thought about solitude and and its relationship to sort of philosophy and Latin American life. And the the quote, I haven't read the whole I haven't read the essay. I just I discovered it through reading this book and kind of looking over the secondary literature. The quote I think is interesting and what he says is solitude is the profoundest fact of the human condition. Man is the only being who knows he is alone and the only one who seeks out another. His nature, if that word can be used in reference to man who has invented himself by saying no to nature, consists of his longing to realize himself in another. Man is nostalgic and in search for communion. Therefore, when he is aware of himself, he is aware of his lack of another, that is, of his solitude. So there's a sense, I mean, maybe there's just, maybe there's just like some existential tragic fatedness <laughs> that this book is kind of getting after. I mean, at least that's the idea. I mean, just from that one quote, that sounds like what Paz's own idea is, that solitude is almost like a lacuna in the eye and that there's just no way of kind of getting around it. And it's just a matter of sort of negotiating and figuring out what the trade-offs are supposed to be in, in dealing with it. And that, and that it's like a central thing in Latin America. Is that what he was saying? Yeah, I mean, he connects this idea, supposedly, I'm literally reading off of Wikipedia, I'm not trying to have any pretensions of being well read here, but, but it's, <laughs> he connects it with a lot of different things, like, particularly Mexican society. Um, and he, it seems to be very influenced by existentialism. He was a big, he was a big deal poet and writer, like Samuel Beckett translated Paz. And I just, I mean, I, it just struck me that wow, there has to be some sort of connection or, so, you know, in some way, there's a sense that uh, maybe I would have to read, actually read the Paz's essay to know this, but there's a sense that Marquez is kind of picking up the idea and blowing it up to epic proportions in, in some way. I yeah. would wonder if that is actually the case. So maybe we can go to last lines and my line would complement that read. But I don't know if you guys have any uh, other thoughts. I don't want to just jump in. I mean, I think that, you know, we probably could have a billion thoughts because this book is so huge. But I did have one question or one thought to, to bring in. Or You remember the uh, banana company incident where all of the strikers or the majority, if not all of the people in the company were murdered by, I mean, all of the workers were murdered by the company. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah. And then yeah. um, Jose Segundo, I think, and he mm -hmm. ended up on the train and he saw all these dead bodies from the massacre being yeah. taken away. And then I guess a little while later, when he was back in town, back in Macondo, and I guess investigating or asking, or it was like it didn't happen. People didn't believe it happened. Yeah. The massacre. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, question. Yeah, I was just thinking about. I mean, it was kind of shocking to me. And what I said, what is Marquez saying by putting out this idea that this horrific, horrible massacre occurs? And then we go through this whole process of Segundo being on the train and seeing these dead bodies on the train. And then we get back to town and people are like, what are you talking about? It's like the official version of history is magical realism. I think yeah. that's his idea there. I agree. Paragraph to you. I think this will help you because it's, it says in this most brutal political episode in Gabo's novel about life in Latin America, the author makes a bold statement with unbelievable grace and style. As a young boy, Gabriel Garcia Marquez saw his town, his family and his life blown to the four winds by the real banana strike. As a man, he comments on it with powerful melancholy and truth, showing clearly how events can be manipulated, revised and excised by those in power. Even the Buendia family, who held every ounce of power at the beginning of the novel, 
find themselves helpless in the face of powerful entities from outside their culture. I've read that. Too. I read something like that, too, as well. And also, I think I also read that company that happened in um, Marquez's family town that collapsed or something turned into Chiquita, the company Chiquita, mm -hmm. I, I heard. But anyway, yes, I, I did. I did see something like that. Some of the funniest, you know, some of the funniest morbid writing was when they caught like the owner, the, uh, yes. the, the owner, yes. and then like though they got lawyers to prove that it wasn't the lawyer. They actually they proved that he was actually dead, and then eventually they proved that the company didn't exist and there were actually no workers. <laughs> I know yeah. it's just so. <laughs> oh, I but thought that's were... literal. That's literal. Well, that's literally what the law is. That you don't have to treat employees as employees because they're you know temporary laborers. That's well, that's like a major thing in the law. But going back to that idea of people in power, these white people in power, and the rich uh, can make things disappear, it's like Trump saying, what are you talking about? Korea didn't put off no missile. I can see how Marquez is, is pointing that out, you know, like people in, in power can make things go away. In a way, we didn't talk about this, and we probably don't have time. But in a way, these are white people, though. Like these are the white people of Mr. Yeah. Brown. Yeah, because there's yeah. also yeah. the natives, right? Right. Who are opposed to the, the inhabitants of the condo, or not opposed, but just like separate from. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, they divert the river. Isn't there a comment early on that I forget which one it was? I but I could have sworn that Ursula had native that she had that she was partially descended from the natives. Am I wrong? Uh, maybe, yes. Maybe that was true for Ursula. I mean, it kind of, I think there was the, the idea being there was some sort of combination of, you know, in Latin America, much more than in the, the, the big, it strikes me that the big difference between United States, how the United States ended up and how Latin America ended up, or at least one of the big differences is that in the United States, there really wasn't combination of peoples. I mean, maybe there is to some extent now, but, you know, at least back in the day, you know, basically the Indians were just wiped out. My understanding, at least, is that there was more mixing in Latin America in terms of the native people and uh, Spanish kind of entering into families. I'm not sure willingly. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, without coercion, but and I, so I don't know. I mean, I, for some reason, um, I mean, I, I, there's a sense that they're, they're their own, it's their, like, I don't know. Sorry, Jennifer, go on. I'm, I'm I don't know when I'm reaching well, I don't out know. You're just making me think of like when, when I go to Peru, um, with my husband's family, right. They all speak Spanish, but then we go to like Machu Picchu, we go to Cusco and right. There's the native people that are there. And the reason they speak Spanish is because Francisco Pizarro came over from Spain and he took over. And it's like the, like a lot of South America is the result of people coming in and conquering, right? And taking over. And I'm, I don't know, this story is very difficult for me to know where it's supposed to be because there's a lot of references to Mexico and he's from Colombia. So I think it's just a whole of Latin America. I mean, did anybody have any clear, concrete ideas about the location? Oh, I wouldn't have a better idea, but Colombia is the birthplace of uh, Marquez, I believe. So. And they, they right. mentioned the Caribbean a couple times, yeah, suggesting exactly. it's on the coast and the the northern coast, at least, of South America. Yeah, I just thought I just thought they for, yeah, I thought it was all over the place because I just know the banana. I thought the banana incident was referencing the uh, United Fruit uh, Company company like, who in Guatemala, basically. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the people who are Spanish speaking in these countries are the descendants of people who have come in and taken over, right? Because the actual native language in a lot of these countries isn't Spanish. So it's kind of interesting, right? That they're, they're the result of a lot of um, oppression. Yeah, and they don't have a really strong connection to Europe whatsoever. I mean, that's what was really striking to me, that when Pietro Crespi came in, it was like he was this foreigner. Fernanda. There's a sense, yeah, yeah, right. Or Fernanda coming in and also being sort of like this, for, she has these pretensions to sort of European nobility or whatever, but it's just absurd. It's so kind of disconnected from whatever the hell Europe was. It was, it, it's, it's a sense of a bunch of people who were kind of like left, left alone <laughs> um, and just on this sort of island and just sort of left to fend for themselves they end up developing their own life. Yeah. 
Do you mind if I uh, throw in a last line? Because I'm going to have to go soon. Go for it. All right. This one is about, I think, referencing one of the Orleano and Jose Arcadios. I think the second pair. Uh, page 280 of my 355. In the small, isolated room where the arid air never penetrated, nor the dust, nor the heat, both had the atavistic vision of an old man, his back to the window, wearing a hat, a brim like the wings of a crow, who spoke about the world many years before they had been born. Both described at the same time how it was always March there, and always Monday, and then they understood that Jose Arcadio Buendia was not as crazy as the family said, but that he was the only one who had enough lucidity to sense the truth of the fact that time also stumbled and had accidents, and could therefore splinter and leave an eternalized fragment in a room. Mm, that's good. That was a good one. Well, uh, I might jump in before anyone steals it. Um, <laughs> and this is what I wanted to tie in with yours, Dan, because, again, like I'm not super married to this, but after what you read in this last line, my big connection, again, is that 100 years of solitude is a human lifetime. The last line is, then he skipped again to anticipate the predictions and ascertain the date and circumstances of his death. Before reaching the final line, however, he had already understood that he would never leave that room, for it was foreseen that the city of mirrors or mirages would be wiped out by the wind and exiled from the memory of men at the precise moment when Aureliano Bibliano finished deciphering the parchments, and that everything written on them was unrepeatable, since time immemorial and forevermore, because races condemned to 100 years of solitude did not have a second opportunity on earth. Like humans. Yes. And like humans. you took my line. Yeah. Uh, I had to jump <laughs> and get it. It's just the best. It's titular. It, I know. Titular. Sorry, Laura. That's okay. There's a, a theme of stealing Laura's lines. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's what Happens all the time. That's all right. I'm good with it. Uh, others? So I have a last line. Uh, this is early in the book on page 65 when... Aureliano is falling in love with Remedios. And it just struck me that his love just leads him into greater solitude. And the line is, he looked for her in her sister's shop, i.e. Remedios' sister's shop, behind the window shades in her house, in her father's office. But he found her only in the image that saturated his private and terrible solitude. Beautiful. Which page was that on? Uh, 65. Someone needs to read the first sentence. Too. <laughs> the first sentence yeah. of the book? The first sentence, yeah. That's so weird. I don't understand you people. First of all, uh, Nate takes my line. <laughs> and then, <laughs> Daniel, you're like thinking the way I'm thinking. I was thinking the first line, the first line. What is this? <laughs> is someone else not going to read it? Here, I'll, I'll read, read it. it. Okay, you read it. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Chapter one. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. It's important. It's very important. It says everything. And also, since you all took my line and everything else, <laughs> I'm going to read this uh, paragraph from uh, the New York Times discussion of this book in 1970. It might have been just another phase in the incestuous life of Macondo, like the 32 revolutions or the insomnia plague. Remember the insomnia mm -hmm. plague? We didn't even discuss that. I mean, that was like, what? Anyway, or the insomnia plague. But enchantment and solitude cannot survive the gringos any more than they can avoid the 20th century. Like so many else in this strange and moving narrative, the end seems to have been inevitable. And yet the North Amer I mean, and yet the North American reader, in thinking of this narrative filled with haunting creatures and events, can hardly help being particularly haunted by the spectacle of his countrymen, the perspiring guests who did not even know who their hosts were trooping in to occupy the best places at the table, period. Marquez has shown us with this extraordinary art who some of the hosts were, or what is more important, who they thought they were. He has also written a novel so filled with humor, rich detail, and startling distortion that it brings to mind the best of Faulkner and Gunther Gross. It is a South American genesis, an earthy piece of enchantment, more, as the narrator says of Macondo, an intricate stew of truth and mirages. I wanted to bring up the metaphysics of this world. How Christian involved is it? I mean, it doesn't like specifically talk about heaven, but anytime there's magic, I'm wondering what the source is or like what. I don't think it's relevant. It doesn't do technology work or, you know, magic powers for people, but 
Like the is I the mean, flying carpet the first example of like no the the there's you? there was the other guy that um you know turned invisible with the liquid you know uh, so yeah. it was like in time with that yeah the magic carpet you know blood you know stream frogs uh, in the water for four years that kind of thing yeah and so I just wonder how much um how how much Christianity has a role. And it's explicitly there, right? They're carrying this Spanish conquest god with them. So I, it's just, it's just interesting to me because I'm wondering, you know, where, where the, where some of the creativity is coming from. But can I suggest something? So think about very long ago when people first came to be people, and you know they're pretty smart and they're stuck in this world where you know, they can figure out causes and they're curious about things. And that naturally leads people to wonder, you know, what the hell is going on with the world. And I just got to a sense that people just sort of began telling stories about what the world was and what was going on in the world and where it came from and all this kind of stuff. Almost as this will to sort of come up with something or other. I don't know. <laughs> like I and I and I get the sense that that basic will to figure out what the causes of things are and understand the world and that it's somehow linked to this practice of magical realism, in the sense that you know Marquez is himself kind of thrown into this world of Latin America with its history. And he's thrown into his own family and, you know, as as we all are. And in telling this story, there's it it's as if he's trying to kind of self-consciously tell the myth of his own people and his own family and his own, you know, world. And just the fact that making it, putting in the magical realism aspects of it is just kind of highlighting sort of what I think he's doing or it's, it's such, there's a sense in which, I mean, he taught during, in an interview, he talked about his grandmother telling him stories, you know, with the straight face of, of fantastic things. And you yeah. got to imagine that's like what the first stories must have been like about the gods, right? Uh, when people were striving to come up with any sort of causes for anything. And there's a sense that that's sort of what's, at least my sense is that's what's going on with the magical realism aspects of the book is that he's trying to come up with any sort of story about how the world is in, in Latin America and, and um, you know, so in any event, that's that's my own take. It's just a guess, but I felt the same way. I felt like the way that um he portrayed things was like from that of a child, where you know, um, what your experience is that he, uh, as a child, is that you know you don't really understand a lot of why the things happen, why things happen the way that they do, but you you have to put together sort of a narrative to explain it and the need for that just you know sometimes things just get explained away in this sort of magical way and nobody really understands it but it's just what we do i mean i think we all i don't think it's necessarily all the different from what we all do we all kind of have these stories that we tell ourselves and there's a point in the book at which they talk about the last two of the generation, Ranta Ursula and then Aureliano Babylonia, when they don't know his origins and they just kind of have to say, well, we're going to not really think about it too much because if we know the truth, then it'll be problematic and it's easier not to know. I think that's the way a lot of it was um, approached. And I thought, yeah, that's like what we do in life. You know, we just kind of tell our version of the truth of things to cope. Yeah, well, I mean, I certainly understand the cultural forces behind creating religion. You know, and I think my concern is just where it's not, I mean, this isn't an actual world, you know, so this is from the conceived mind and that person is bringing to bear certain kinds of understandings. And if they have a framework that they're playing within, I kind of want to know what that framework is, you know, if things are... Um, you know, and, and so some of these, like some of this magicism or whatever, it doesn't really change how you would do anything in the world. So it, it or it, it itself is the unexplained phenomena. So I don't think that it's actually standing in to explain another phenomena. You know, I mean, it's just Remedios, the beauty floating up. You know, it's not like she was carried away by a wind and there was a story about her floating up. So, 
the origination of the like primary fact is what's interesting to me that there is this magic. I mean, I read it much more as phenomenological and I think it makes sense that way to communicate these events are usually like something to somebody. So, you know, the way that it makes an impression and, and then that would lend to that cultural argument, I think more because then we can imagine that these characters in this cultural position through narration are experiencing it as such. Um, but these are a lot of distinctions and um, this is another conversation for like an hour. Yeah. Um, I will give you my last line. I cut out for a while there. Yes, we're waiting on you. I just I, oh, that was very nice of you. I'm sorry. I lost connection. So I have no idea what you guys are talking about, but I will just share that mine is completely arbitrary. Just was meaningful to me, not necessarily to anyone else, but it said there was, it's several lines. Um, this is the part where Aureliano Segundo is living or staying for a long time with Petra Cotes. And he says, intrigued by that enigma, he dug so deeply into her sentiments that in search of interest, he found love because by trying to make her love him, he ended up falling in love with her. Petra Cotes, for her part, loved him more and more as she felt his love increasing. And that was how in the ripeness of autumn, she began to believe once more in the youthful superstition that poverty was the servitude of love. And it's not really those lines because just those lines on their own don't necessarily, you know, they're not so impactful, but it's what happened in their relationship in context to the story that I thought was just a really nice, I, I liked that. I thought that was a bright spot in the really sad book, quite honestly. Yeah, it was quite remarkable, that relationship, the way it evolved. But I did want to say one thing, I, in case you don't know, uh, but maybe y'all do, that uh, Netflix is coming out with uh, this yes, saw that. next year. Just well, wonder, how the hell could that no, work? I want it to work. But I mean, his relative, Marquez's relatives are involved. Oh, so that's yeah. one thing I wanted to bring up. You know, his son is, um, goodness, I, I forget it, but you can find it. He is behind the HBO show um, In Treatment. It, it came and went years ago, but I, I think it's wonderful. And there are, is, you, are you talking about the, the In Treatment where the guy's a therapist? Yes. That's really? And his son is behind yeah. that? Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. Also find his son because he's also like a producer of The Sopranos and oh my god um, has so follow his son's name and you're gonna find good stuff. Wow, he's fascinating. He's also like Garcia Marquez, like but he I forget his first name. Rodrigo, Rodrigo Garcia Marquez. Wow, well, see the names. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's like so common. Everybody in my family's name, by the way, is Carlos. Just so you know. Um, but I am fascinated to see how they're going to do this. I'm so excited for it. If he's if he's got any hand on it, then I trust it will be good. I mean, oh, good. So visual that like I mean I just want to. You could just film that blood from Jose Arcadio, like that scene itself. Oh, oh yeah, yes. From the line out to yeah. Oh, that's so. Oh, that'd be so cool. And we're saying, like, can we just talk a little bit about some of the imagery? I know we got to go, but I just have to say that, like, the time when there was the rainfall for four years and they pulled yeah. bushes off of Ursula's back and everything was covered in moss and gr like, that's when you really felt like this is a mythological sort of story. And then when the dryness came and Ursula gets her second wind, were you just not like, oh my gosh, when you read that part, can you believe Ar Aramanta did that to the poor crispy guy or whatever? God, I hope they do this. They're not gonna. I mean, are they gonna cut anything out? I can't imagine that he would do anything that would just. You know what I mean? Like I have a lot of. Once you said that, because they did a movie of Love in the Time of Cholera, and it was terrible. Yeah. And they took because they took it for realism. You know what I mean? That's you the lose, problem. Yeah, you lose the the the. I hate saying uh, that. Yeah, but I don't know how they're gonna do that because I mean, like, how could you do the insomnia plague or like you say the four years of 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 the rain? I mean, and what happens to the streets in Macondo after four years of rain? I mean, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to do that. I got to... It's got to be like very much exaggerated. It has to be definitely sort of like obviously not realism where it had, they have to go deep into the magical portion of it because otherwise you're going to, I think you would miss the whole point of this. Do you know there, there's a director, um, I think it's in your Ritu. I, I might be mixing these guys up. The one did um, the movie Beautiful um, with Javier Bardem. And there is a huge magical um, realist inspiration from that. Um, the, um, the lead speaks with um, bereaved people. And in the film, you see his, what he sees and he sees ghosts. It's not like about that. It's just that's his phenomenal deal. His experience. Um, 
And that director, I think he, uh, Alfon- no, it's not Alfonso Cuaron, um, but it's Inuritu. Um, he came out with, look, just look up the director Inuritu and um, okay. you'll find good movies that are like this. I would recommend Beautiful. If right. you want to see yeah. something that's like this, then that's Beautiful. Uh, spelled B I. No, I hope they use Javier, Javier at Prodem for this. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish they used him for everything. <laughs> yeah, for everything. I agree totally. So one thing I want to, you know, the easy part of this is going to be the CGI. The hard part is going to be the tone because it's easy to have like humongous CGI monsters and blah, blah, blah. And oh, isn't this so cool? But like you have to make the CGI so it isn't cool. So it's just like reality. So it's like his grandmother just stating a fact. That's going to be the hard part. Yeah, that's my, that's what made me think of the American Gods is because yeah, you're, I don't, if you've ever watched that show, you're watching it and it feels very sort of realistic and normal. And then all of a sudden these bizarre things happen. happen. Yeah. You're kind of, you have to be jarred by it, right? You have to be like, are, is this, are we all tuned into the same channel? It's, it reminds me from Dust Till Dawn where you're kind of watching it. And then all of a sudden, did you watch that? With yeah, it's a, it's a two-part movie. Uh, I really enjoy it. Whenever I saw it, I was like, oh, this is a great movie, like really down to earth. You know, and then it just goes off the rails.